We're ready to get started here. Uh, good morning. For some of us, it's very early in the morning, but uh, myself included, I'm Mitch Chang. I uh, work at UCLA, so uh, it's a little past 5 uh, a.m. right now. <laughs> and, um, and I have the distinct privilege today to serve as the chair of uh, this session. And again, you know, there might be some uh, logistic confusion here, but this session is uh, titled School Segregation, Desegregation, Resegregation, and Integration documenting and troubling a dream deferred. Uh, for those who are looking for a critical dialogue in American classrooms, that's uh, two doors away. Um, as noted in uh, the description of uh, today's session, it's been uh, 60 years now since Brown v. Board of uh, Education decision, and racially integrated schools still remain an elusive dream. The purpose of this session is to examine the elusiveness and assumptions of this dream by documenting and troubling the persistence, evolution, and effects of school, of school segregation, as well as this prospect, character, and unrealized promises of integrated schools. Thanks to Bill Trent of the University of Illinois, who uh, organized this presidential session, a world-class group of scholars have been assembled to achieve this session's uh, main purpose. I'm sure many of you already know uh, each one of them through their work, and if you don't, it would take the rest of this session to properly introduce each one. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to list them in order of when they will present. Uh, first up, uh, and I'm so glad you made it, is my colleague, UCLA colleague, uh, Gary Orfield. He will be um, followed by Russ Rumberger, and I believe uh, he's probably at UCSB these days in Stanford, uh, probably commuting uh, uh, up and down the state. They will set the context for John Diamond from the University of Wisconsin and Amanda Lewis, who uh, hopefully will join us uh, as well, who uh, are, are co-collaborators on a project, and closing the session will be Amy Stewart-Wells, um, who uh, had to travel the longest distance all the way from Teachers College, Columbia University. So uh, without further ado, uh, Gary. Good morning. I had about an hour-long journey here. It was about as long as it takes to get to Sacramento from Los Angeles to get over here this morning. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. Russell uh, was at dinner with, with us last night, and we were debating whether anybody would actually come on Monday morning at 8.15, and uh, it's wonderful to see you and, and to recognize some old friends in the group. So. I'm going to try to do a few things in my brief time here. Uh, and I decided the first thing I was going to do was talk about some misconceptions. Because I've been reading a number of papers that presented at this conference and listening to people. And there's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people claim there was a huge effort on, at desegregation. And there, there, there was. But it was for only a period of five years. And it ended oh, 45 years ago. Um, we only worked on it hard for about five years, where we had the federal government actively committed to doing it. And that ended with the Nixon administration, and it, and it ended in the Supreme Court after President Nixon got four appointments. Um, that was the last really big push. There's been no significant federal effort to desegregate schools since the early 1970s. We have not spent billions of dollars desegregating. There's been no federal money for desegregation since 1981, no significant money. So it, it's not true that we spent a lot of money on this and it failed. We spent very little money on it and it actually succeeded in some important ways. The people who were bused did not have a terrible experience. If you look at the surveys at the time of their families, they actually said they had a positive experience. Uh, and that was some, true of all races. Segregation is not unequal because of the color of skin. It's unequal because of the nature of society, all the things that are related to race in our society. And they're profoundly related. And all of the statistics I'll be showing you 
desegregation opens up the possibility of access to a lot of positive things, but it doesn't mean that they'll happen. Desegregation is the first step towards integration, and people understood that 45 years ago. And we've, you know, this is not a miracle. We knew a lot of the conditions for successful integration in 1954 when, uh, Gordon Alpert published The Nature of Prejudice and specified the conditions under which interracial contact happened in a positive way. We actually worked on it a lot in the 1970s and we had a billion dollars a year from the federal government to train people about it. That was the biggest education program totally eliminated by Ronald Reagan. Um, so it's very important to realize people weren't naive about this. They did understand that you not only have to get people in the door, but you have to get them in the classroom and you have to retain the teachers and so forth. And a lot of good research was done during that period. The last period where we've had significant research funding in this area. It was understood a long time ago that you had to do much more than just open the door. But opening the door was a necessary but very insufficient condition. We've had massive racial change in our society. The last time we really thought seriously and worked on this issue, we were a different society. Back in 1970, when the last really serious effort was made, right around that period, we were 79% white students in our country, 15% blacks, only 5% Hispanics, 0.5% Asians. Look at us now. We're 49% white, 15% black, not much change in that, but 26% Hispanic, more than quintupled. 5% um, Asians, we have as many Asians as a share of our population as we had Hispanics back when we actually worked on school desegregation. We have a four-race population, we have a two-race policy, um, and no, nobody's trying anything. And, Basically, the, the idea of really seriously integrating the immigrant populations that came in in these huge waves in the 80s and 90s never happened. We never tried anything significant. The demographic realities are we had a basic drastic decline in white and black birth rates. We have had population growth that's been driven mostly by immigration of Latinos and Asians. Um, and if you look at the West today, there's many more Asians than there are blacks, and there, are, there will be very soon substantially more Latinos than there are whites. We're getting to be a four-race society, which is a very complex society that requires much more sophistication than we have from the policies that were developed for a different society. We have had a large increase in non-white suburbanization. That's where most racial change is happening. We have not addressed it. It's been virtually ignored. The result, of course, is massive resegregation of the suburban schools. Um, we've had a really large growth in multiracial communities and multiracial students. Um, we haven't really figured much out of that. We have a great deal of, of integration between blacks and Latinos that we don't address at all. In the West, the average Latino kid, or the average African American student is not in a black school. They're in a really impoverished school where there's twice as many uh, Latinos as, as, as uh, fellow blacks. Um, what do we do about that? Who's been thinking about that? Uh, nobody really. It doesn't work out naturally really well. We've had a sharp increase in the percentage of our kids in the United States who are poor. Really dramatic. Um, shocking. Um, and we basically have a, a law and policy to the extent that we have it at all that re comes from a different era um, and addresses different problems. The, we have really intense double segregation of blacks and Latinos by race and class. Even more severe for, for Latinos than for blacks. All the progress of the last half century since the late 60s has been lost. We're back to the level of segregation we had then. But we're not back to the level we had before Brown. A lot of people write about that. That's just totally wrong. Um, we'll see um, a little later. These, the segregation is directly linked to different opportunities and to different outcomes, but especially to opportunities. <laughs> 
students of color are not prepared fairly for college. They are in inferior high schools that aren't connected effectively to colleges. Uh, and it's very dramatic when you look at longitudinal just data. 5% of US schools were 90 to 100% non-white in 1988, and it's now 19%. Um, we get my, we're getting many more of these schools that we don't know how to deal with effectively. Nobody's ever dealt with schools like this effectively on a large scale. There's individual dedicated people who have done amazing things, but um, these, rec these um, relationships are very systemic. The relationships between race and poverty and, the and almost all the inputs and outcomes of schooling. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that crossing the racial line is enough. It isn't. It's just a start. The percentage of Latinos in intensely segregated schools went up from 23% to 43%. Blacks went from 64% intense segregation in 1968 to 30% in 1988. People say it didn't make any difference. It did make a difference. It made it for a long time, and it made it mostly in the South, which is the only place we ever really concentrated a serious effort about desegregation that lasted. Um, we never did that for Latinos. Here's the trajectory of policy. From Brown to the Civil Rights Act, nothing much happened. 10 years after Brown, we always celebrate Brown, but Brown was a failure until we passed the Civil Rights Act. 98% of black students were in completely segregated schools 10 years after Brown. After the Civil Rights Act passed and the Johnson administration worked on it, the South became the most integrated part of the country within about five years. And it has remained that way more or less to this day. Um, we are in the epicenter of segregation here. New York is the most segregated state for black students and the second most for Latino students, second or third most. We have no policy for Latino students under Brown. They weren't included in Brown. They were included in a case called Keys from Denver almost two decades after Brown. It came up during the Nixon administration. They never did anything about it, and nobody else has done much about it since. We just never worked on desegregation of Latino students, and they are profoundly isolated, uh, some almost always by ethnicity and by poverty, but often also by language background in the school, which we call triple segregation. The last serious federal desegregation program ended in 1981. In 1991, the Supreme Court authorized canceling out the plans that existed. And ever since, there was an increase of desegregation for black students that lasted from the 1960s until 1990. Beginning with the Supreme Court change in 1991, we had experienced increased segregation virtually every year. Um, so, and in 2007, to add insult to injury, the Supreme Court prohibited most forms of voluntary integration that had been popular around the country for several decades, and most of which were supported by local school districts. So here's what we have. We have children growing up in segregated communities with unequal schools. A lot of people are researching the community effects now, especially economists who are working with vast data sets. There's low education, job discrimination, less employment, lower wages in these areas. There's housing discrimination that means weaker neighborhoods and weaker schools for students of color. Um, there's greatly increased chances of incarceration for people who grow up in these segregated neighborhoods with segregated schools. Weaker schools mean less success in college. Uh, there's a pretty strong relationship. If you have less success in college, you have less income to buy housing and if you can overcome residential segregation in neighborhoods with good schools. And so it's a cycle that replicates itself intergenerationally very powerfully. Ooh, um, all my answers have disappeared. <laughs> Let me try something else. This is like what you don't want to have at your PhD oral. 
Well, let me just tell you what some of the statistics would show if I had had them on, <laughs> if they had come up. Um, basically, what we've seen is we've seen a steady, I think that probably it didn't get copied somehow. It's okay. It's not your fault. <laughs> That's right. Let me just sit, uh, say a couple of words more about what's going on. Um, we have had the dissolution of most of the desegregation orders that existed in the country. Even before the courts dissolved them, they were being dissolved by effect because beginning in the 1980s, uh, the federal government changed its side in desegregation cases, especially during the two Reagan and one and three Bush terms. Um, they consistently opposed and asked the courts to dissolve desegregation efforts. That's been successful in almost all the large school districts in the country now. So there, no, there is no effort. And a lot of the voluntary efforts um, that local communities supported were dissolved by challenges in courts, especially, and some of them after the parents involved decision, which outlawed any kind of voluntary desegregation that required consideration of race. So how do you desegregate if you can't consider race of students? It's very difficult, as we know, who work on affirmative action. Fundamentally, right now, we are in a situation where there's virtually no support for communities that are going through racial change and resegregation. What's going on now around the country, as our book on resegregation of suburban schools shows, is that a steady spread of racial and, and economic segregation, which are highly correlated, oftentimes at like a 0.7 level, um, has been going into larger and larger sectors of suburbia. We have a lot of school districts that are now trying to exit from larger school districts to protect uh, white and middle class Asian students. Um, Asian students are, by the way, the most integrated group of students in the country and, of course, by far the most successful. Um, white students are increasingly in contact with non-white students, even though the non-white students, on average, are more segregated because of the demographic shifts in the country. Um, we are not really working on training people about how to deal with this or using techniques that were developed and actually proved during the desegregation era. There's a lot of things that could be done and there are special opportunities that relate to the suburban racial change and to the gentrification that's taking place, but they're not being attended to seriously. There, and there's a serious risk that various forms of choice systems uh, will exacerbate this problem, as we see, in, for example, in North Carolina, where we're beginning to develop white, um, white flight uh, charter schools in the, in the Charlotte area, for example. Um, so we have a, something that we've never solved. We've never really solved what the Brown decision said was inherent inequality. We haven't invented a good alternative that works. Um, because it's a problem that's multidimensional and it's related to many things. It's related to whether or not teachers stay in schools, teachers systematically leave schools of color and poverty as their experience grows. So do administrators. Those schools are much more unstable in enrollment. They are schools that have more limited curriculum, much weaker connections with colleges. None of these things are absolute. There are exceptions to everything, but they're small exceptions. And as you go from elementary schools into secondary schools, the number of exceptions gets smaller and smaller. So we're looking at a dangerous pattern, and it's not a pattern that affects a small minority anymore. It's, it's a pattern that affects the majority of the people who make up the future of our society. Um, we haven't discovered an easy way to work through race relations. As anybody who's lived through the last two years of American politics is well aware, um, we're not working on it anymore. To think that we can do it indirectly is a delusion. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on Title I and many kinds of forms of assistance and targeted extra aid 
for kids of color, for kids of uh, language minorities and so forth. None of those have produced equal outcomes. If you've looked at the most recent NAEP, you'll see that in the last decade, we've made no progress on racial gaps. Um, we are dealing with very serious, deeply systemic problems, and we're throwing away a tool that is potentially powerful, um, but complicated, and thinking that we can figure out an indirect way to deal with it. I'd say the experience of the last 60 years and of the 60 years before Brown shows that that's not true. This has, been, this has been quite a morning. Um, so I was actually asked to talk about the, what we know about the impact of segregation on st student achievement, and particularly focusing on uh, several large uh, nationally representative data sets that have been used that many of you probably have, are well aware of that NCS has constructed over the last 40 years or so. Um, Gary, you know, provided a very broad framework about this issue, so, but I'm going to kind of barrow down a little bit and focus on just one aspect of it, which is really, does it really matter, you know, what the, and what do we know about the, in terms of empirical research? Um, so there's been a lot of research using these national data sets I mentioned, and they actually have several advantages of looking, in, in looking at this issue. Um, you know, one of them is that they're nationally representative. So when we talk about, even though there's a lot of regional variation in That's some of the fine. issues that Gary was talking about, you know, we'd like, we'd like to get a broad picture of it. So they are representative nationally. The second thing is they um, create samples of both schools and students. And that's really important empirically because we want to separate out the effects of individual background, which we know is highly powerful in explaining student outcomes, from the school effects themselves. So that, you know, what we're interested in, or many people are interested in, is what's the school aspect of achievement as opposed to the individual. And we know most of the variation in student achievement outcomes is related to individual background characteristics of students. But at least some of it is related to the school environment. So the question is, what's the impact of that school environment? So these, these studies allow us to look at those, um, you know, to separate out those individual effects from school effects. And the third thing is that they're longitudinal. So they follow students over time, and there's been several of them, again, many of you are well aware of them, on either kindergarten-focused cohorts that tr track kids through elementary school, or high school or middle school-based samples that start stu tracking students in eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, through secondary, and of course, many times into college and even in the labor market later on. So a lot of the outcomes that we're interested in looking at is, is achievement or progress of students over time. So we can look at things like growth in achievement scores, test scores. We can look at high school graduation rates. We can look at college enrollment, college persistence. Now, can I move this thing? Is that? How about that? Great technology. Uh, so this was actually the, the the introduction to that is that there's been a lot of claims about what school effects really are. And I think there's a very broad consensus about the fact that schools matter, and of course teachers matter. But the question is, what is it about them that matters? And of course, Clay, Coleman found in his study from years and years ago that he found that the social composition of the student body was the most highly predictive element of schools that affected outcomes. Um, and, that's, and his study, as you probably know, has, has been replicated uh, by Jeff Borman not that long ago, and, and the same conclusions came out using kind of more sophisticated methods. But as you can see in the last quote down there, that, that it's, it's been used, uh, claims have still been made, in this case, as in, in the state of New York uh, court case, that, that who you go to school with doesn't really matter. Um, but again, the research contradicts that. So this is the issue I just talked about, the, the why we could use some of these national data sets. And what I was just going to do uh, with my short time today is just present a few of the outcomes of some studies that have tried to look at this and try to show you how, how, not only how they're done, but what we find from these kinds of studies. So I'm not claiming that this is a canvassing of all the research. And of course, some of this research I did, my, with, uh, with, uh, I did myself and with one of my students, Greg Pilardi. Um, so in order to do this kind of thing, you want to, again, look at a variety of outcomes, and these national data sets provide those kinds of outcomes. Again, test scores are a common feature of them, but student achievement, of course, is more than test scores. So we can, again, look at things like high school graduation rates, college graduation rates, even student behaviors of some kind or another. 
And, and then we want to have <clears throat> uh, an analysis that includes both background characteristics of students and characteristics of their schools. So we look at things like minority status, gender, academic background. But also at the school level, we want to really look at different kinds of factors at schools. And, and these are all kind of related to each other. <laughs> this. <sighs> yeah, you might have to stay up here with me, I think. Um, at the school level, we look at kind of four sets of factors. We're looking at student composition, of course, but student composition, we know, is related to other aspects of schools that also matter. So school resources, of course, is one, one of them. Um, school structure, like you know, whether it's a private school, public school, size of schools, things like that. And then lastly, school practices. Um, you know, leadership practices, instructional practices, disciplinary policies, and things like that within the schools. So all those things in this con, you know, con, uh, form a, a set of influences on, on school effects, and we want to try to separate out. And, and now, how long this is going to last, we don't know, right? Um, so we, what the idea of these empirical studies is we want to separate out, uh, does, does the composition really matter in and of itself? In other words, who you go to school with really matter? Or is it really just a proxy for these other characteristics of schools that, write, that might contribute? So that's really what the nature of this research is trying to do. Uh, as I said, I went through um, a set of studies, you know, many of my own, of course, but others as well, just to kind of get a, a lay of the land and some of the different outcomes that have been looked at and then different measures of social composition. The most common being both the socioeconomic composition of the student body and the racial composition of the student body. But as Gary mentioned, another aspect that hasn't been looked at nearly as much as the linguistic minority concentration of students, as well as you can look at um, the concentration of students in terms of academic background and things like that. So this is about 10 studies of re relatively recent studies, not all of them, um, based on these national data sets and what we find. And you can see the most consistent finding is that social class uh, composition of the students really matters, both in terms of predicting achievement scores and test score growth and high school graduation or dropout. Racial composition effects in and of themselves, um, or, or after, I should say, controlling for socioeconomic composition, um, tends to be less consistent in terms of these findings across these studies. So I'm just going to show you a few of the results. I, I know we're running behind on time anyway, so I don't want to take too much time. And this is kind of getting in the, in the weeds a little bit. But I, don't, I just wanted to sh illustrate the kinds of things that we can find from these studies. So this was a study of looking at fifth grade achievement on one of the national data sets called ECHLS. And in this case, uh, we divided the population of schools into, we identified private schools, low poverty schools, middle uh, income schools, and high poverty schools. And you can see in the blue bar that if you, if you just look at unadjusted differences, there's huge differences in student achievement across uh, those kinds of schools. So high poverty schools have much lower achievement than low poverty schools, as you can see. And middle poverty schools are kind of average, right? So that's kind of what you'd expect. And private schools have a very high level of achievement. But once you control, so this is fifth grade achievement, we can control for kindergarten characteristics. So that's the characteristics of the students walking in the door. So once we control for those things, what does this analysis tell us? Well, you can see there's, the, the vast disparities that we see initially are great, greatly reduced once we account for students' um, socioeconomic backgrounds um, and their initial achievement levels. So if you look at, um, so one bar controls for one, the second bar, the yellow bar controls for both of them, and you can see there's huge reductions in these disparities. The thing that's kind of interesting to me is a lot of the issues about, um, or not a lot, but at least some aspects of the f issue of desegregation is the idea that, well, everybody should attend middle class schools. If we could just get every kid to be able to at least go to a middle class school, things would be much different. Well, you can see that once we control for those background characteristics, there's not that di much difference between um, in terms of student characteristics uh, between middle class schools and high poverty schools. Um, and even the, the apparent advantages of private schools kind of disappear. So in other words, there's a kind of selection effect into private schools that in and of it suggests that they themselves are not necessarily that effective in improving student achievement. But where you see that student achievement gains most starkly is in the low poverty schools, low poverty public schools, I should add. So even controlling for those background characteristics the greatest advantages in, uh, in achievement growth is in low poverty schools. So, um, and, and as Sean Reardon, I think, has made the same point, which is, you know, it, with all our interest in kind of improving schools from the bottom and getting them into kind of, at least up to the level of middle class schools, 
the, the, another issue in, in our society right now is the increased advantages that the high income, high class uh, kids are having by attending these low poverty schools. In fact, low poverty public schools in particular. So that, um, that the issue of kind of segregation is more than just kind of raising the bottom up to get them up to kind of some middle level, but the really advantages uh, that we see in, in different, in some in di different indicators of achievement really occur between the kids at the high, high end level. You know, that they're, they're, that they're advan very advantaged in getting into these, in, in these low poverty public schools. We have some near us. And what, you know, one example of what happens in these places is they not only have the state funding as they get as a public school, but they can raise a lot of parent contributions um, through PTA and, and fundraisers and things like that that further their advantages in terms of school resources as well as the student composition of the school itself. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, show you a couple other results that kind of say, um, do the same thing. So again, one of the ideas of these kinds of studies is to identify the school effects separated out from the individual effects. So uh, this is a, a study done with um, test scores from eighth grade to twelfth grade. So it's growth in test scores. Um, and you can see that it's, uh, we try to look at the effects of student background characteristics, which is student SES and, um, and uh, uh, individual SES. And you, basically the findings were that um, school SES was just as powerful effect on student outcomes as their own social economic status. So in other words, it, it reaffirms, first of all, that schools matter, but second of all, social class um, is a very powerful determinant of, of school growth in and up, independently of individual SES. Um, and this is another, uh, this is another uh, cut at the data, looking at uh, dividing the schools into high, middle, and low SES schools. And you can see that there are advantages of, of going to high um, poverty, or low poverty schools, I should say, um, among all uh, social groups, you know, disadvantaged students and as well as advantaged students. So the idea being that I think focusing simply on, again, kind of raising the bottom up or getting kids to, you know, kind of equalize in terms of cross uh, social class groups and getting into kind of a middle class mentality of saying let's have middle class schools for everybody, the advantaged kids are still going to be, uh, you know, better off than everybody that's in the middle class uh, even if they were able to get into a middle class school. Um, and lastly, I want to show a, a, another analysis of done of, this is on high school graduation rates. So this is looking at um, low, middle, and high class schools and low, middle, and high class students. So we divide it, I can, I can look at the effects of, of students of different social class backgrounds attending schools of different social class compositions. And you can see at the high end, the disparities are not that great between students' own individual backgrounds and the school. So everybody does well, uh, relatively well, in a high social class school. Just, but you can see when you go down to low class, low social class schools or high poverty schools, that the disparities between individual backgrounds are more pronounced. So in other words, for, for kids at the low end, it, it re they really benefit from going to a higher social class and, um, environment, as you can see on the, on the right-hand side of that graph. But on the left-hand side, it, it shows that the, the students that, that are high social class in, in low or high poverty schools, low SES schools, which of course there's probably not that many of them, um, they're still di at disadvantaged, but their disadvantages are not that great. Where the disadvantages are really more pronounced are low, social, low SES students who attend low social class schools. So, um, so you can see that the results of these analyses, in my mind at least, suggest that you know, all students benefit from going to a, a better environment in, in schools in terms of social class composition and, and all the things that that entails, which again is correlated with things like resources, but also in terms of just who your uh, student peers are that you attend school with. So everybody benefits from going to a kind of, quote, richer environment uh, with more advantaged students. But uh, as I said earlier, the, the idea of, of improving uh, outcomes for disadvantaged students by, if, if we could, and I think Gary suggested a pretty pessimistic analysis of, of our prospects for doing this, but if in fact we could you know, create more middle class schools through, the, through integration efforts or other kinds of things, it wouldn't really eliminate these disparities that are growing in our society between the high social class students and, and virtually everybody else. So it's a kind of another twist on our challenge, I think, of, of reducing disparities in our society, which is to not only 
um, raise the bottom up, but somehow you know, you know, get more integration at, ideally at the higher end as well. And in the absence of that, I think we're facing a situation where we're gonna have you know, in, uh, increased disparities in achievement based on the fact that we have not only this, the, the overall patterns of segregation that Gary talked about, but also a kind of a concentration of, of schools and students in these high, um, high income schools um, that will further advantage and, and distance the students at the high end of, of our distribution um, away from both low income kids and middle income kids. Thank you. So, you know, looking at what happened before, I decided I would add another element of technology in with my iPad to make it even more complicated. Um, I guess my, how do I get it over? All right, so thank you. Um, let's see if we can get it to work, and if not, I'm just gonna like riff a little bit. Um, so I wanted to start out actually using a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, who's actually one of our greatest scholars, at least of the 20th century, who because of white supremacy never got his recognition until black scholars sort of reinitiated the, the fight to get him recognized in the academy. Um, but he had something to say about school segregation in 1935 in the Journal of Negro Education. Again, without that journal, he may not have had a space to have this conversation and discussion. We have to remember that in the desegregation fight, there were also other kind of battles going on. Jack Doherty talked about people fighting to get more black teachers in schools because that was an economic foundation and a powerful role that they could play in the Milwaukee schools. Um, there were other kinds of fights going on that weren't about desegregation and it wasn't a, a chosen and decided fight that African Americans were gonna fight for integrated schools. So what Du Bois argues is, the Negro needs neither segregated schools nor mixed schools. What he needs is education. What he must remember is that there is no magic either in a mixed school or in a segregated school. A mixed school with poor and unsympathetic teachers, with hostile public opinion, and no teaching of the truth concerning black folks is bad. A segregated school with ignorant placeholders, inadequate equipment, poor salaries, and wretched housing is equally bad. Here, Du Bois argues with great clarity that black people need education, not integrated schools or segregated ones. White schools with racist teachers and an anti-black curriculum are in inadequate, as are black schools with lack of sufficient resources. Derrick Bell dis demonstrates a similar ambivalence toward integration when he critiques our almost religious zeal regarding the Brown decision arguing that the process of integration has become conflated with educational equity itself. That orthodoxy often overrides our ability to understand that integration was just a means to an end, a compromise in a white supremacist society in which white people have used their power to monopolize educational resources for their own children. Therefore, Having a debate about school integration absent a careful analysis of racial structures and racial opportunities inside and outside of schools and the poisonous role that racism itself plays in the educational process is ill-advised and potentially dangerous. So for the next few minutes, I want to ex uh, examine the often uh, unspoken relationship between race, white supremacy, and integration. I will do three things in this regard first I want to uh, reinforce the centrality of white supremacy in the US and its educational enterprise, as if it needs to happen in the Trump era. Second, I want to demonstrate some ways that white supremacy currently embeds itself in the organizational routines inside schools, and I'll draw my work with Amanda Lewis to do this. Third, um, I want to highlight how opportunity hoarding by white parents is the primary force that undermines integration and educational equity. So it gets back to some of what Russ was saying before about what's going on in these high-income schools. Well, white people are hoarding educational opportunity, and elite whites are doing it even stronger. 
Most conversations about school desegregation fail to fully acknowledge the central point that white supremacy is the reason why we have segregated and separate educational institutions in the first place. The core challenge of desegregation is that most people racialized as white do not want to go to school with people racialized as black and brown. This is at least in part because of their belief in white supremacy and black inferiority. Having been raised in a society defined by a disdain for blackness and black people and the belief in black intellectual inferiority, white see schools with black enrollments as inferior. In fact, they will avoid schools with large black populations even when those schools outperform mostly white schools in the same area. But understanding race requires more than a superficial glossing over of its origins and implications. Race is a social construction developed by white people to justify the brutal treatment and murder of those defined as non-white across the globe. Europeans developed racial ideologies that espouse their intellectual and moral superiority over other groups. While race is based on arbitrary physical characteristics, it shapes the social structures, institutions, laws, and interpersonal interactions in ways that perpetuate white supremacy. As Bonilla Silva argues, societies like the United States function as racialized social systems across all dimensions of social life, as Gary talked about, which contribute to the reproduction of white supremacy. Other scholars have spoken, uh, such as Mills, have spoken about global white supremacy as both a dominant ideology and a social system. This is not to suggest that race is the only form of stratification. In fact, we know that class and gender, for example, exist simultaneously in an interlocking system or matrix of domination, as Patricia Hill Collins has talked about. Nevertheless, white supremacy is among the most powerful organizing principles of the United States and the globe. It provides the ideological foundation that justified settler colonialism, the attempted genocide of indigenous peoples, the colonization of Africa and the dividing up of that continent and murder and everything else, and the enslavement of Africans in the Americas. It is encoded in the United States Constitution with the three-fence clause, implicated in the continual denial of sovereignty to Native Americans, and instantiated in the historic and contemporary immigration policies that originally excluded non-whites from access to this country and uh, from citizenship. It also gave wise to white supremacist terrorist organizations that unleashed murderous assaults on black people who simply wanted to register to vote, live where white people didn't want them to, or learn to read or form educational institutions. This white supremacist uh, terror continues in the hyper-surveillance and state-sponsored extrajudicial killings of African Americans, Native Americans, and Latinx people in this country. The arrest of black people for walking down the street, swimming in the wrong neighborhood, sitting in Starbucks, and the contemporary examples are contemporary examples of this hyper surveillance. And of course, black people continue to be murdered by police for standing in their backyards, failing to use a turn signal when driving, or reaching for their wallets during a traffic stop. These are the modern day manifestations of anti-blackness and predatory white supremacy. And these things happen to function in schools as well. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk about how all this matters, what happens in the educational context of schools. And I'm going to draw my work with my colleague, Amanda Lewis, a longtime collaborator in our book, Despite the Best Intentions. And what, I, what we did in this book is we studied a, a multiracial high school and tried to understand what was going on in this place where everybody said they loved desegregated context, they wanted integration, they wanted a community that was racially diverse. What happened in this context that made the racial disparity so stark? And what we argue is that it ha what happened is race became embedded in the organization and routines of those contexts, and that white parents hoarded opportunity. Every time there was an attempt to make a change in this context, white parents essentially shut it down. I'm embedded in a couple of school districts now. I got to use it. Basically, and you know this, if you've worked or lived in any of these communities, anytime there's a change in an integrated school that's attempted, elite white parents shut it down, reshape it to their interest, uh, make it work for them. So, uh, thank you. So, how does all of this happen to embed itself in the context of schools? If you're raised from cradle to grave to believe that you're superior as a white person, 
If you raise from cradle to grave to believe that you're inferior as a black person, what does that do to the educational context? Well, what we argue is that status beliefs become really powerful forces in shaping how people understand and see the world. Status beliefs are widely shared cultural beliefs that people who belong to one social group are more esteemed and competent than those who belong to another social group. I'm going to focus on race here, but Cecilia Ridgway has talked about this in the context of talking about gender particularly, but we use it here to talk more specifically about race. I also want to um, talk about organizational routines. Organizational routines are sort of recognized patterns of practice that happen within organizations. AERA is an organization. This session is a routine. Everybody knows what happens. People get introduced. They come up. They talk. You know, some of them ramble like me, and others are more you know concise and to the point. Um, but there's also um, and that's sort of the, what we talk about is the ostensive aspect of the organization and routine. That's pe the way people understand things. In schools, these are like lunch breaks, teacher breaks, um, conversations in classrooms, what happens when kids are working in groups or larger groups, small groups or larger groups. It's also about discipline. It's about tracking and how those routines are understood. Well, the performance of those routines is where the social status gets embedded because when people interact with each other, immediately they determine I'm talking to a man, I'm talking to a woman, and they uh, have a whole bunch of baggage associated with that about what that means. The way that race plays itself out is that uh, there's a strong belief in the intellectual inferiority of black students, and I'm focusing particularly on black students, but you can extend that to Latinx students and others. And that plays a role in how people are interacting with each other when they're making decisions about distribution of resources and how they should interact with those people. Now it's frozen. So, you know, basically how this, ha how this works is, for example, people are applying for jobs, right? And you sort of think about, uh, you know, getting a job is about applying for the best qualified person submits their stuff and they get hired. Well, it doesn't work that way. Diva Pagers looked at this. You send out African American, Latino, and white folks for a job, and what winds up happening if they have the same resume as the white folks get more callbacks, right? And we know this plays out in the labor market, and Gary talked about the fact that there's labor market discrimination, right? But there's also the issue of if you say that the white person has a felony record and the black and Latino folks have clean records, the white person still gets a call back more than African American and Latinx folks, right? So we know that the status beliefs that people carry in their heads, even if looking at objective data that says that people are very similar or the same in terms of their resumes, they're still going to more likely hire the white felon than the black person with the clean record, which suggests that blackness in itself become suspect. Blackness in itself means that you can't sit in a place where everybody sits and not get arrested and spend nine hours in detention under arrest for doing nothing, right? So this also plays itself out in the context of school. So what we found is a hyper surveillance that existed in the context of, thank you, a hyper surveillance that existed in the context of schools. And I want to make an example of this is thinking about the hallway pass. In a lot of schools, you have to have a pass to walk through the hallway. At Riverview, that was, this was definitely the case. Students who leave the classroom, uh, the student discipline code says, must provide a, a pass uh, from a teacher or supervisor. Students without a pass face school consequences. We interviewed 170 plus people in the context of the school. Um, 70 plus students, and what we found is that even the white students knew that the black students were being hyper surveilled in the school, right? So as Maria said, I think security guards point out African Americans like a lot more than white. Like I'll walk down the hall without a pass and they'll just let me go. But then they'll see someone else, you have a Saturday detention. I think it's really uncalled for that they don't stop everyone. This played itself out in the context of people bringing drugs to school, it played itself out in the context of fighting. It played itself out in many different contexts. And I want to shift a bit to talk about opportunity hoarding, because even in the context where white students were bringing drugs to school, their parents still came in to talk to folks to try to manipulate the process. Opportunity hoarding is the process through which dominant groups who have control over some good regulate its circulation and prevent out groups from having access to it. That's what's happening with our education system and has happened since the beginning of uh, the presence of folks of color in the country, right? You learn to read, we'll kill you. You form a school, we'll kill you, right? I even know that the history of Piney Woods, uh, of independent school in Mississippi, is that they had to strike a deal with the Ku Klux Klan to even have the school be there in Mississippi, right? And so white supremacy is not something that is just about hoods, 
the white supremacists that we see in the hoods are the sort of terror squad, the enforcers of a broader system of white supremacy that we've all been sort of indoctrinated with to a greater or lesser extent. So I'm going to talk about opportunity hoarding, and I have no idea how much time I've spent, um, but I'm going to keep going until somebody stops me. Um, opportunity hoarding um, in the context of this school sort of played itself out when we're thinking about educational tracking. So in the school, at the time we studied it, it was 48% white, 41.3% Hispanic, 8.5% uh, uh, black, 8.5% Hispanic, and a smaller population of Asian students and Native American students. But when you look at the tracks, and this might look familiar, 78 0.7% of the uh, students in honor tracks are white. 87.6% of the students at AP tracks are white. And this is replicated all over the country. So you can walk into a school and know what kind of class you're looking at based on who's in there, right? But then when Riverview tried to change the structure, and they, you know, eventually they were able to get the structure changed. It took 15 years, right? How many generations of kids went through this school without getting access to the best classes? District administrators talked about the fact of, of the fight, right? I counted them at one point, an administrator said. I attended over 200 meetings with parents of kids to talk about the standards and the fact that we needed to common standards for our kids, not different standards for different kids, to uh, reassure people that our high-end kids were not going to, were not, this was not about dumbing down the curriculum, right? Every time they tried to make a change to create more mixed-level classes, they had a fight. And these are the white parents who are, perpetuating white supremacy by hoarding educational opportunity, right? And then once they were able to restructure their humanities courses, there was something that they called internal white flight, the administrators talked about. One history teacher said, many of our Arnas kids that had a fre as a freshman had parents who strong-armed them, white kids, into studying like Russian history. And they would say, well, mommy, I, don't, I have no interest in Russian history. I want to study Africa. They say, you're taking Russian. Or mommy, I have no interest in Middle East. You're taking Middle East. And those classes became largely white honors, Russia or Russian and Middle East. So not only were people you know, trying to keep the spaces separate, they were also creating little white enclaves in the context of the tracking structure within the school itself, right? And beyond that, they were institutionalizing the advantage. How many schools do you know of that have grade weights for being in honors classes? So one of the administrators talked to us about this, and he said, you know, as we started um, digging deeper into the conversation, he said, you know, I remember talking with Mr. Weber, who was one of the uh, folks who were working on minority student achievement. When it first became an issue and a real focus in the 90s, he was showing me the distribution of grades based on race, and the thing that shocked me was the grades of white students. There were a number of kids that were, not, that were getting A's and B's that I really don't think were operating at what I would consider an A or B level. Part of the achievement gap is going to be exacerbated by the weighted grade system, right? If you concentrate white students in the upper level classes and then their B is a B plus and their A is an A plus, and you concentrate black and Latino students in lower tracks and their grade is just their grade. But one of the teachers said, you know, basically talking about this sort of power structure, some changes would just uh, be too much for the district to take. I would love to do away with rated grades but I think people would just die, right? And it's really not about what the kids are getting, it's about access to educational opportunity at the next level, right? And just a side note, and, and I'm get to my concluding slide, it doesn't really matter that much where the kids go to college, even though parents think if they go to Harvard, that's the only place for them to go, right? So you can get a great education in a lot of different places. And so part of this fight is a worry about declining fortunes and the maintenance of status, but part of it is an acceptance of white supremacy and opportunity hoarding, right? So for, in conclusion, I just want to make the argument that we need to take white, race and white supremacy seriously in a discussion of integration. If we don't, you know, the discussion is, is going to continue to wane and, and not get to where it needs to be. We need to examine, and we can examine, the performative aspect of organizational routines uh, to provide insight into how racial inequality is reproduced through the daily interactions that happen in the context of schools, right? That's where it gets reproduced at a micro level. And to my estimation, um, there's a lot to say about that's how it can be interrupted. And finally, we have to you know, pay a lot more attention to how white parents hoard opportunity, right? 
absent white supremacy, absent racism, absent this sort of um, deep investment in white supremacy, school integration wouldn't really be an issue, right? Because we wouldn't have the structures of inequality, we wouldn't have the wealth disparities, we wouldn't have the income disparities, we wouldn't have the policing disparities, but this is the world we live in, so we gotta take it seriously. So I'll stop there and we can uh, continue. So I agree with everything that's been said this morning. Um, and I'm going to try to talk about um, where we go from here, which is why I'm last, and hopefully have slides. So, um, so because I still believe in the emancipatory potential of education, I'm going to try to think about everything that's been said and connected to some work we're doing at Teachers College um, to, to try to take what we know from the research and move forward. So um, I'm not going to go through all this because this has all been talked about already, but I think there are some things that we need to remember in terms of who are the parents of this generation of students, and that's the millennial parents who do say at least they're more likely to have interracial marriages. So the demographics are changing. We have more, more biracial students. Um, we do see changing um, racial attitudes, at least in terms of surveys, but I'm going to problematize that as well. So there's a lot going on that creates some potential here for more meaningful integration. Also, just the things that we talk about with a lot of parent groups around what the colleges say they want, what the, what the employers say they want, the metro migrations that Gary mentioned, um, with more blacks, Latinos, and Asians moving to the suburbs, more whites moving into gentrified areas of the cities. We've actually been studying both of these contexts. So these potentially more racially diverse contexts are, are increasing. The problem is that we're seeing these patterns of resegregation, that we're seeing that the diversity is very <coughs> unstable and very fragile. And so we're trying to think about how do we intervene at the public school level to try to stabilize um, some, of the in, some of the de facto desegregation that's happening and how do we create meaningful integration. So there's a lot of research we've done on this cycle of resegregation um, that has a lot to do with status and reputation of schools and what does that mean in terms of how parents um, make choices about schools, particularly those who have the most choices to make, white and high SES parents. Um, and so one of the paradoxes that we've been focusing on is that uh, on average the greater education of the white parents, the greater likelihood they respond to a high percentage of black students in the surrounding area by moving their children from the assigned public schools. But these are actually the same parents who have the highest, the highest racial attitudes in terms of being accepting of more racially diverse contexts when they're answering a survey question. So we have a real problem here in that those most likely to say they want integration are actually least likely to choose it. So, and that relates to all the status things that John and Amanda's book talks about and opportunity hoarding. So I'm just going to retrace some of the things that we've already touched on today to think about where, how do we move forward in the current context. So we have opportunity for more diverse schools to be created demographically, attitudinally, at least on survey data, and then just the way the metro migrations are happening. Um, but we need to really consider this history and all the research that's been done in order to really strategize in moving forward. So we do want to think about the ways in which desegregation was implemented. We want to contrast the policy context of K through 12 education with higher ed. Um, just to note that um, we did abandon our efforts to create more di diverse schools by the late 1980s, as Gary mentioned. Um, we have very fragmented inter uh, school districts, right? Um, and high levels of inter-district segregation that makes any efforts to make change very difficult. We have an accountability system, and we see how that seeps in, how we measure schools, right? How we define good schools, how parents say they're choosing schools. Actually, we find they don't really look at the test scores often until afterwards. 
Um, but then, so they use that as, legit, as a way to legitimize their choices. So this accountability system is very much driving segregation and resegregation, and we need to think about that in, in terms of our roles as researchers in using those data to define good schools and achievement very narrowly. Um, school desegregation litigation has waned, and most educational research on sociocultural issues in K-12 pedagogy is not connected to diversity desegregation. So one of the tragedies, I believe, in K-12 through research on um, desegregation and segregation patterns is it was so disconnected from the work being done on within curriculum and teaching around multicultural education and as that evolved in culturally relevant education, as it's evolved into ethnic studies work, we have been very dis distant. So a lot of the desegregation conferences have been a lot of people who do policy analysis, who do quantitative analysis, who do legal analysis, and we haven't been connected to those talking about teaching and learning in, just in schools. So we see again um, this process of resegregation and the way in which it's playing out in urban and suburban contexts right now is, is very different. Oh, sorry, that's the gentrification bingo. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a, it's a great slide. So, we're, so when we think about what does that look like um, in terms of public education, right? Yeah, I'll just give me one second because we don't have a lot of time, but we can go back to that. So um, for those of us who believe in the promise of education, of a public education and a diver within a diverse democracy, what do we do? Um, so what does the research say? We are all here together to think that research says something, and it does. So we do know, as Gary mentioned, and I'm going to go quickly through this, that, that um, separate is inherently unequal because of all the, the concentration of poverty, the, the lack of resources, um, lack of lower expectations in low-income, um, high percentage black and Latino schools. Um, and on and on and on. Lack of political support for these schools, which we don't often talk about, but we have seen in the suburbs and the impact of that. Um, but, when, but then we need to learn from our history. So as we've been highlighting here with all the research, uh, desegregation improved the, the student outcomes, particularly as measured by um, test scores. It also improved uh, mobility uh, for black and Latino students, just access to um, schools with more rigorous curriculum and more resources. And desegregation did improve racial attitudes. I've definitely interviewed um, graduates of desegregated schools and learned that myself. So desegregation was uh, necessary but not sufficient for all the reasons that John and Amanda tell us. Too little was done to address the sociocultural issues. And again, this goes back to the disconnect between a policy, thinking of desegregation as a policy versus thinking of desegregation as a pedagogy. Right? And that was where we got in really big trouble. Um, we lost the black teachers who were incredible, incredible teachers within those communities. Vanessa Siddle Walker's work is, is so helpful in helping us reclaim that history and understand the importance of what was happening in those schools around a community of care, an African American uh, pedagogical model. Uh, black and Hispanic students were sent to predominantly white schools where teachers were told they should not talk about race. I've actually interviewed those teachers and they were, despite the federal money that was put into professional development, many of the principals and school board members did not want race to be talked about in desegregated schools. Race was a taboo. We emphasized the fact that we were not emphasizing the color of skin. Um, we, these were interviews with teachers who worked in desegregated schools. And then in terms of the curriculum, as far as the teaching goes, desegregation didn't really affect the canon, so we're still teaching dead white men for a long, long time. Okay, so we didn't change curriculum, we didn't change pedagogy, we weren't talking about race. These processes of resegregation, white privilege reasserting itself within desegregated spaces happened again and again. So the fact that we actually had some positive outcomes is pretty amazing. So we, we see these second generation segregation issues that were happening. Um, and they were real. At the same time, there is some evidence um, that integration or, or attendance in racially diverse schools can be beneficial. Um, we've seen this in the higher ed research that supported affirmative action. Um, and we see that particularly when we look at, at, at research on uh, not, not only students of color, but white students as well, um, in terms of issues of implicit bias and decrease of implicit bias. Um, and increased democratic outcomes, which I think is also very positive in terms of engagement and political issues. So we're seeing this kind of mixed uh, story coming out of the research, a mixed narrative, and we're trying to understand 
So we know that white privilege, white supremacy is a problem in this, in this country that's certainly central to the way in which we've organized schools. We know that desegregation tried to address some of those issues, but certainly did not do enough, and it got, became reasserted with within, inside the schools when, it, when we did create racially diverse schools. Still, we're seeing some positive outcomes through the, through the data. So I think, and obviously we know that segregation is harmful not only to education, but to a democratic society that's as racially diverse as ours. So solutions would be to begin, we argue, by broadening the definition of what good schools are and changing policies, practice, and discourse to support that. So we do every summer in July, you're all welcome to come, <laughs> we're doing it July 16th through 19th at Teachers College. It's a summer institute called Reimagining Education, um, Teaching and Learning in Racially Diverse Schools. And I have a video, but I'm not at all sure it would play, and I think um, we're out of time. So I'm gonna skip it, but we do have a session today at 4.05 if anyone's interested in hearing more about this interdisciplinary work. These are the four themes that we've organized the Summer Institute around. So we're why, re why reimagining? Um, using the knowledge of our field to kind of, re, to kind of redefine what real integration would be and how it's good for all students. Um, and that, in, that includes reimagining, obviously, the curriculum and sociocultural issues. The second day, we focus on racial and cultural literacies. And this is PD for teachers, so teachers earn PD credits from coming to this institute and teaching ourselves and our children to recognize, respond to, and counter inequality related to race and certain cultural orientations. Then we focus on equity pedagogy. What does this look like in your classroom? And culturally sustaining leadership. What kind of leadership do we need in schools to sustain this? We're also talking about um, parents and community members and local stakeholders really understanding the benefits of diversity, but going deep into these issues that John and Amanda so vividly point out about what's happening within schools that are racially diverse and how privilege is reproduced. Um, we're also doing a project called The Public Good that we use to support um, racially diverse schools and we use research to engage racial and culturally uh, diverse school constituents in facing the power dynamics and difficulties um, and, amplify, and amplifying voices is needed to create a truly integrated and inclusive public school. This is not easy work, it's very difficult work for all the reasons that the research has just um, told us. But we actually think, we call it a public school support organization because we don't think there's enough support for public education at the grassroots level. Um, and we provide research-based uh, engagement. So we actually do research with parents. We do interviews with parents and educators and local community leaders to really understand how they're making sense of issues of race within the school and racial diversity. So a lot of white parents are so good at saying, I love the racially diverse school. And then when you really delve into it, it's like as long as I can get my opportunity hoarding that John and Amanda talk about. So really trying to problematize that, but first really understand how they make sense of it so that we can then engage them. And, and, and show them why this is problematic. And it's not easy work, trust me. And also in New York City where we're doing this work, you have extremely high income white parents. So those of us who have any clue what a new condo in Dumbo costs would really know the kind of you know, uh, so, social status that we're dealing with here. Um, and then we have very low income students of color and then we have some middle class uh, families that are, are, that are of all different racial ethnic groups. So this is quite a challenge. Um, but this, then we use strategic communications once we build consensus on what a good public school is that is racially diverse to try to change the discourse around a good school because often these more diverse schools actually have lower average test scores um, or sometimes have actually higher test scores than they're given credit for. But the point is that we don't want to just define these schools based on these very narrow measures that are also part of a, of a white supremacist um, or way of organizing curriculum and, and valuing knowledge. So we connect our research to the origins of action research grounded in concern with ethnic relations. If you actually look at the history of action research, you'll see um, that that was the beginning of it. Um, and a belief in local democracy and need to restore a sense of community. So that's exactly why we're doing this work. This is just more on um, the sites and, the, and some of the, the methodology we're using that I think we're out of time to go in depth, um, but I'm happy to talk about it. And we're working on a book about it. Um, this is just a quick example of a gentrifying parent with the savior complex we talk about. So this was at the beginning of the process of working with one of the schools. 
and she said, um, there was this energy, like we're going to make this such a great place. Yeah, I definitely got the message that there was a new regime. So this is the colonization of black and brown schools that have been tied to communities for a long time. And when the white parents come in, they come in with this attitude that we're gonna fix this school. So the very work that we're trying to do is to say, oh no, 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 I mean, <laughs> hold on. There's actually a lot of really good things in this school and we're gonna talk to you about what they are. We're gonna talk to you about what, why these things are important to the community that's there, with this, that's a part of the school and has been a part of the school for a long time. Um, and we're gonna change the way you think about this new regime and its benefits for the school. So that's the kind of work we're doing. Um, we're redefining good. Um, we're, we're trying to make schools community-centered by broadening the sense of community. Um, we find that, the, that these, a lot of these schools have a lot of um, the African-American pedagogical model that Vanessa Siddle Walker um, has talked about in terms of this, this, um, this, met, this kind of uh, curriculum of care for everyone and this sense of a school ethos of care and support for all students. And actually, what parent doesn't want that for their child? And then a lot of these schools are doing very um, incredible work around uh, what we could, would call more progressive pedagogy in, in the white high SES neighborhoods. Um, and what we're seeing is that a lot of the, the ways we're labeling the curriculum is also very segregated, right? So we may call it progressive education on the Upper West Side, but we're calling it culturally relevant in another context. And so we're trying to think about how do we integrate the way we talk about the curriculum. And I know I have to go, but this is a quote of a parent after we've been working with one of the schools. Um, and so it's, she's, she's, this is a school with a tremendous principal who's been working on these issues of, of, um, of race and parents' understandings of race. And she says, this is the kind of evolution um, you can see with white parents when they're a part of a community that's really grappling with these issues. Um, and so then she's realized that what's best for her child is what's best for this whole school. So that's a beginning of a way of reframing you know, this, this white opportunity hoarding and seeing a school as a community for all students. So that's the work we're doing. Um, and then just to think about, to take it back to the policy level, I am in a Department of Education policy. Um, so why isn't there accountability for diversity? Why do we consider racially isolated public schools to be good schools, meaning all white privileged schools? that can adequately appear, um, prepare student, their students? Why aren't K through 12 policymakers, officials, and educators building on the arguments put forth by universities in affirmative action cases about the educational benefits of diversity? How can we change the paradigm to embrace the new public for public education? So that's what the policymakers should be talking about. Thank you. We have time maybe for a couple of questions. So if, uh, if anyone wants to get us started here, we, we may be able to squeeze in a couple. Yes, please, in the back. Thanks. Uh, I think this is a question mostly for John and Amy. And uh, I just wanted to respond to some of the history that Jerry laid out and why it does or doesn't matter to what you're advising. Because there's, there's a way in which some of the, the problems that seem like these very, you know, deeply rooted, either, you know, based in history type problems or uh, problems of class related to this opportunity courting. But then the solution set seems a little bit like a non sequitur in that it, it's asking for kind of re-education of parents or reorganization of, of school routines. And there's not much talk about the deployment of state power or politics uh, in these solutions. And I wonder if yeah. you I mean, talk about, is that just because this is the, this is where we're at in the 21st century, or yeah. the legacy of those mm -hmm. like progressive, more redistributionist policies from the Orfield era have any kind of you know story to tell for you guys? I mean, I, I consider myself. I mean, I, I wasn't Gary's student, but I, I consider myself Gary's student. Um, <laughs> Gary is is one of the people who I look to as a a, 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 a touchstone in how you be an activist, engaged, rigorous scholar. And I think the work that he does and the work that Russ was talking about is really important to setting the context. But I think when you talk about state power, you know, state power took Native American kids away from their families and indoctrinated them with Eurocentric culture. State power established separate schools. 
state power is right now, you know, functioning in a way that is really re has retreated for the last 30 plus years from uh, trying to help integration happen because it's, you know, basically responded to, a, uh, to uh, placate whites, right? So I think the, the battle around what we, need, we can do in terms of policy, I think is clearly outlined what we need to be doing. And I think Gary's work uh, really helps us understand that. Um, but I don't hold a lot of hope because most white parents don't want to go to school with black and brown kids. So that, that's not, it's not going to happen. So the reality is, and you know, that doesn't mean that I am completely pessimistic about the future of education. I work with schools, I work with teachers, I'm using the organizational routines frame to help them unpack the routines that reproduce inequality. I start the conversation with white supremacy and I go through it with them to talk about the ways that we've all been indoctrinated with this and it impacts how our organizational routines happen. And then I go in and talk with them about, in their classrooms about how can we make a change? How can you change your practices? So I'm thinking about, you, you know, I've been using uh, work on improvement science, I've been working, using work on distributed leadership, I've been using work on design, diagnosis and design and education to use organizational routines to unpack processes at the school, classroom level, school level, and district level. I'm spending the year now learning from district administrators about how is it that they make racial change, make change to racial inequality in the context of their schools, even up against opportunity boarding, right? But I think the, for me, the place that I choose to enter the conversation is the place where I can do the most work right now. And you know, state power and change is not where I see the change happening because state power often works to reproduce white supremacy. So that's, you know, but I'm not dismissing the work. It's not a non sequitur. It's just that I'm interjecting this into the conversation and I'm interjecting it into my work and recognizing the realities of what we're dealing with. So. Anyone else did you? Okay. You know, a lot of the things that we need to do is are things we actually did in many places, but it was 50 years ago. Um, we had total apartheid in 17 states. We had uh, vast changes that took place in a short period of time, the only period when we really worked hard on this. Um, the fact is that the most radical programs that included city and suburbs and mandated desegregation lasted for 30 years. They were the most stable programs, and parents basically liked them. The Charlotte School District spent a million dollars trying to prove it was still guilty. And, and should not have its desegregation ended, and the courts forbade it. Um, you know, it's, it is not true that we haven't used state power. We stopped using it, um, and when you don't use it, you know, you don't, if, if we had incentives right now for suburban school districts that were multiracial and going through resegregation, there would be lots of districts that would apply, especially if it were defined a little vaguely. Um, they need it. The, it's not, the costs of resegregation are enormous. After you go through resegregation by race, you go through it by class, you go through it in the housing market, you, you, you lose jobs. There's a very systematic process of, gen, of ghettoization that takes place. Um, and it's hugely costly. And we're not, and many people have immediate interests in not having that happen. While white parents don't like to be in resegregating schools, they leave them pretty fast. If the school is stable and it has a significant middle class population, it's a very different picture for both parents and for teachers. Um, so we have to think strategically about these things and we do have to think about how, in, how to use incentives and resources and training processes that some of us actually control in our universities uh, to address these issues. Um, and they're not rocket science, um, but they do require focus and they do require some resources and they do require some incentives and there are actual solutions that do make a difference and we're not working on it. And people in the academic world aren't helping much most of the time. There's a very small number that are actually working on thinking about how to use the tools we have uh, more effectively to address these issues. Let's try to squeeze in uh, one more question, if there is one out there. Yes, sir. So one of the results of a few centuries of opportunity hoarding is that the vast majority of academics, policymakers, teachers, 
administrators at every level are the very category that has all the opportunity hoarded, right? So what, if any, role does racial representation in those different categories play? Uh, because I don't know that I saw that so much in the sort of agenda going forward. And, and what are the sort of tactical things that we can do in the short term, to your point, to start to drive change in terms of how racially representative teachers, researchers, educators, administrators are? So, I mean, I think absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we see in um, the resegregation of the suburbs, which happened in the urban districts 50, 60 years ago when whites fled those urban districts, is the, the Right, you're absolutely right. The whole, the school board, the superintendent's office, the central office, the principals, most of the teaching staff um, remain white as the student population changes quickly. So that is a huge, that's a huge problem. And um, we're seeing it, you know, in, this, in the city it's, it's better, the, the racial, the makeup of the teachers and the leadership is, is more diverse as the white parents are coming in and, and using all sorts of interesting strategies to <coughs> manipulate um, those administrators. But, um, you're, I think you're absolutely right. We do, we do, obviously, we need a more diverse teaching force. We need more diverse leadership. We need, um, we're still, we're about 80% white in terms of our teachers. The work we're trying to do at the Institute and at Teachers College, while we do have several initiatives to recruit um, more African Americans, Latinos into teaching, um, we're also trying to just you know, I think so much of the way in which schools have been structured, the way in which pedagogy and curriculum has been mandated through these state tests has made teaching a much less attractive profession, particularly if you're questioning the norms that are, that are perpetuated through those forms of assessment. So, um, you know, really pushing back on that. I know I'm so encouraged that New York State has implemented culturally sustaining pedagogy as one of our standards for ESSA. I know there's the work going on in California and Oregon with ethnic studies. I mean, we need to make schools places where people of color want to work because they can teach the way they want to teach and they can actually support students of color the way they need to through curriculum and pedagogy that is sustaining. And as long as schools are structured in such a way that there's very little room for that, I think it's gonna be you know, difficult as well. However, we're gonna keep trying. Yeah. Can I just add? Um, that, that's, that's really great. I, I think the point about you know, diversifying the teaching force, you have, if you diversify the teaching force, you have to also have uh, schools that are ready to receive that teaching force. I know Travis Bristol's done some really good work on this with black male teachers. And uh, one of the things um, I, I just wanted to add that we've been doing at the University of Wisconsin in Madison is we have a partnership called Forward Madison, which is all based on uh, trying to build on the strengths of the university and the school system. Part of what we've done is created a teacher induction program in the district, a principal induction program in the district, and a pipeline program to create more um, diversity um, among the teaching force, as well as uh, change some things in, in uh, HR to hire more uh, black teachers. And in that process, I think we've learned a lot about how the university and school districts can partner uh, in research practice partnerships that allow for creating more opportunity. Our pipeline students, our first cohort, um, a large percentage of those students actually have, uh, have been admitted to the University of Wisconsin Madison. We started working with them when they were sophomores. And so that's, in, you know, in building a pipeline of people coming through. There's a pipeline program that we're building from people who are working in the schools but don't have the credentials to help them accelerate their credentials, uh, getting those credentials to then move into the classrooms. And the final thing is that the induction program is really based on trying to engage people with a coach um, who can help them uh, reflect on their practice, but also be thinking about these issues of race and equity because that's a core mission of what the district is doing. And we've had, you know, hundreds of teachers now come through that process. And as you build a cadre of new teachers who've been inducted well, who can improve their practice, you know, over those first few years and have race and equity at the center of their work, that helps change a culture in a district, right? And so I think that's the kind of uh, thing that I think we can do at a local level to make the kind of change we need to see. Could I just say one more thing real quick? The other thing we need to pay attention to is all these public schools that are being closed in urban districts. That's where we're also losing a lot yep. of teachers of color. And nobody juxtaposes those two things. So we're, the report comes out that we, you know, we're, the number of, of black and Latino teachers is declining. And then the next article is we're closing 10 more public schools in Chicago. And, we're lo and a lot of those teachers are going to be gone. So. We need to really think about, you know, talking out of both sides of our mouths in terms of the policy world on that one. 
I see the folks from the next session is starting oh. to fall oh. in. So please join me in thanking our panelists again. Thank you.